Welcome once again, and in this session, we're going to be reading Mark chapter 2. We're going to continue with the ministry of Jesus, and like I said, Mark is a, you know, quite a book here because he, he really just just compacts everything all together really, really tight here. Uh, he talks about the whole gospel uh, in, cha- in just only 16 chapters. So, yeah, he goes through the life of Jesus very fast, and um, we get, you know, he says a lot of stuff in a very small amount of space. So, Let's start out with verse 1. When he, as Jesus, entered it again into Capernaum after some days, so he had to wait until the crowd was gone. Again, you got to remember we're, we're leaving, we're starting where we left off at the end of chapter 1, where Jesus did these miracles and then he healed the leper, told the guy not to go uh, tell anybody, tell, tell him to be quiet about it, and he went and told people anyway, and, and just crowds of people went and swamped Jesus so much that he had to withdraw himself. Uh, when he again entered into Capernaum after some days, so he had to wait until the crowd subsided and the buzz, so to speak, subsided, he had to go back uh, after some days. When it was heard that he was in the house, you know, excuse me, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many were gathered together so that there was no room, no more room, not even around the door. So it was just packed and people were outside. There's a crowd outside the door. You couldn't even get around the door. And he spoke the word to them. What Again, what's the word that he spoke? We see that in, ch- in chapter one. You know, repent, turn from your sins, rise above sin, get, get out of your sin. Turn from your sin, change your mind, change your life, come into submission to God, Get in line with his guidelines and his rules and and his instructions for your life. For it's easy. It's easy. According to John, Deuteronomy chapter 30, it's at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right there for you to grasp. Okay, so that's the word that he spoke to him in context. Verse 3. Four people came carrying a paralytic to him. When they could not ent- when they, when they could not come near to him for the crowd, they removed the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, so they broke the roof. Sounds like a you know a fireman trying to break into a, a burning house, right? When they broke up the roof, they they let him down, uh, let down the mat that the paralytic was lying on. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, "Son, your sins are forgiven you." Okay, now verse six. But there was some of the scribes sitting there, so the scribes were right there too. In the house. Jesus didn't kick him out. They were right there. They were the ones that were there and they were interested in Jesus just as much as, well, it seemed like just as much as anybody else. Uh, and they were there reasoning in their hearts saying, why does this man speak blasphemies like that? Who can forgive su- sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, said to, said to them, why do you reason these things in your hearts? Which is easier? Basically, you have multiple choice here. One, to tell the paralytic your sins are forgiven. Or, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, I tell you, right? Arise, take up your mat and go to your house. Verse 12, he arose and immediately took up the mat and went out in front of them all so that they were all amazed, glorifying God saying, we never saw anything like this, okay? Again, very quickly here. Notice, it wasn't the paralytic himself, it wasn't his faith that did it. It was the faith of the friends that brought the, that brought the paralytic to Jesus. So those never ever condemn a person for lack of faith. You know, oh, you're not healed because you, you, know, you just got to have enough faith. No, how about you have enough faith for them? Huh? Yeah. How about you have enough faith in them? The disciples, when they came back from praying, they said, Oh, Lord, we, we, haven't, we weren't able to do what you did. He didn't say, Oh, it was their fault for not having enough faith. It's your fault for not. The ones that are praying, it's your fault for not having enough faith. So the prayer is the one that's responsible, not the prayee, not the one receiving so much, okay? Uh, also, Notice here, Jesus is equating the forgiveness of sins to healing. Forgiveness, healing. I've seen this in my life before. I remember um, going around preaching the gospel, and and, uh, we always had a thing, you know, this was years ago now, 
where uh, all of the females uh, was uh, a female dealt with the females and the males dealt with the males. Okay, and there was this one elderly lady and one of the female um, members of the team went to speak with this elderly lady and she was a new, you know, she was somebody who basically, she was an elderly lady. Actually, I think she was like living like in an elderly home kind of thing. And um, and she decided to, you know, give her heart to the Lord, so to speak. You know, back in those days, you know, that's kind of the thing, the thing we preached. But uh, she revealed that she had some things against her mother. And the uh, team member that was working with her, uh, the female team member that I was referring to, uh, said to that elder, elderly lady, you should forgive your mother. Now, this elderly lady was crippled. She was crippled. Okay, She had to go around with like crutches or not crutches, but like canes or walkers and this kind of thing. When she decided to forgive her mother and she prayed to God and said, God, I forgive my mother. Instantly, she was healed. Instantly, she was healed. How did that work, you might say? Well, you know, Jesus said, if you want forgiveness, you got to forgive. If you don't forgive people, you won't be forgiven. So there, we, uh, one plus one equals two here. You forgive, you get forgiven, you get forgiven equals healed here in this scripture right here we're reading. Okay? So some of you who are listening to me right now, you are experiencing different diseases, different sicknesses, different problems in your life that God can heal you from, you need to ask God, who do I need to forgive? Show me the faces. Show, give me the names of the people that I need to forgive, and, 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 and I will forgive them. And, go, and God will show you. If, you. if you really take the time to do it in your personal life, ask God to, to show you the names, give you the, uh, show you the faces of the people you need to forgive. He will show you. And as the faces come before you, as the names come before you, Say, Father, I forgive. And say the name. For, be specific what you forgive them for. Forgiveness is a, is a choice, not a feeling. You may not feel like forgiving them. You got to choose not to hold this grudge against that person. That's basically all that forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not feeling. Forgiveness is choosing to let go of the grudge. It's not denying that it ever happened. It's not forgetting about it. It is just choosing not to hold a grudge. Okay? And just go through the list that God gives you. And a lot of you are going to be healed. Okay? A lot of you are going to be healed. Why? Because you, you will forgive and God will just automatically forgive you. And you will automatically get free from disease, sickness, evil spirits, torment, depression, whatever you're going through. Stress whatever it is, okay, you will get free. I've seen it. I've seen it in my life. And, and by the way, when you do that, start number one with your dad and your mother. That's the things you got to start with first. Father, is there anything I got to forgive my dad for? Go through all the list of things that you think about. And specifically say, Father, I forgive my dad for this. I forg Father, I forgive my dad for doing this. Other and be specific what? What it is. And go through all the list until you're all emptied out. Until you get it all out. And then do the same thing for your mother. And that will open the door for great blessing in your life. I guarantee you. Guaranteed. Actually, right now, pause the video, pause the teaching and do it and come back. Okay? Verse 12. He arose and immediately took up a mat and went out in front of them all. They were all amazed and glorified God and said, we never seen anything like this. Okay? He was healed because he was forgiven. Verse 13. He, speaking of Jesus, went out again by the seaside. All the multitude came to him and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, 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 the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the, at the tax office and said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Again, how and why would he just up and leave everything? His family, his friends, everything he has, his house, his job, just to follow Jesus. He must have known a lot of things. 
about Jesus. He must have he must have known, okay? And I I believe he did, considering uh, all the things that I mentioned before in the previous session, Matthew chapter one, verse fifteen. He was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners came uh, sat down with Jesus, and and his disciples, for they for there were many, and they followed him. Okay. The scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, he said to his disciples, Why is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Okay? Let me say this again. Okay? The people, I know that some people, they, some of you, you hang out with sinners. And you justify it by saying, well, Jesus was a friend of sinners. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Jesus was a friend of the sinners who were looking for help out of their sin. Not just, not just any old sinners. If you're just hanging around with sinners that are not looking to repent, you're in for trouble, but you're in for trouble. You're in for something, okay? It's either their it's either you are influencing them and you are you are dominating them or they are influencing you or both okay god forbid both or they are influencing you okay that's why it was it was a uh, uh, an accusation by the pharisees and scribes that he was eating and, and drinking with the with the with the sinners by the way according to jesus who were the real sinners it wasn't the ones sitting around him it was the hypocritical people hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. They were the real sinners, according to Jesus. W was he friends with them? Okay. So he was friends with the sinners who were repentant. Jesus said again, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Notice there are such... Jesus right here plainly and clearly tells us there are and there were righteous people. He says, I don't come for the righteous people. I come for the sinners to call them to repentance. Okay? Again, there's this set, there's this, the stage is set for repentance. He wasn't just hanging out with them, smoking dubs, drinking beers, whatever, whatever you think that you're doing with, with sinners. No, he was calling them to repentance. If you're not doing the same, you better not be too much friends with these people, okay? One more factoid I want to give you here before I move on, and that is Jesus could have said, I come for everybody, like how they say today. Jesus comes for everybody. He come, I come for everybody, okay? So just lighten up, for, uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees. Uh, I come for all of you. I come for everybody. No, he didn't say that. He said, I don't come. I'm not here for you, or I'm not here for the righteous. There are the righteous. They're over there. I'm not here for them. They don't need me. I'm here for the sinners to call them to repentance. Verse 18, uh, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they came and asked him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, can a groomsman fast while the bridegroom is with them? The groomsman being, okay, he's talking about a wedding now. Now we got the bridegroom, who is the, the man who's getting married. And the groomsmen, which would be like the best man and other people that were there celebrating with the bride, with the bridegroom. Oh, you know, our friend's getting married, so uh, we're here with him. Uh, if can the can the groomsmen fast? Can the right, you know, the the you know the best man fast? Can the uh, you know all the other people that's on the groom side, the husband side, can they fast while the while the bride while excuse me while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they can't fast. Because they're in days of feasting. They're in days of celebration, not fasting. This is time to rejoice and celebrate. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Jesus is talking about when he is crucified and resurrected and ascended. And then they will, they, they will fast in that day. No one sows a piece of unshrunk 
cloth on an old garment or else the patch shrinks and the new tears away from the old and a worse hole is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins or else new wine, uh, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine pours out and the skins will be destroyed. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins. Okay, so Jesus is saying we got two different, two totally different settings here. You need to understand, you've got the Lord of glory looking at you face to face right now. You've got the King and the Lord of all creation looking at you right now. The King of kings, the Lord of lords looking at you right now. The creator of heaven and earth looking at you right now. So you better rejoice a little bit. It's not a time to be weeping and fasting right now. It's time to rejoice. You're blessed. Verse 23 he was going on a Sabbath day through the fields, and his disciples began as they went to pluck ears of grain, assumingly ears of corn. The, the Pharisees said to him, uh, Behold, why do they do that which is not lawful on the Sabbath day? And he, speaking of Jesus, said to them, Did you never read what David did? Okay, So Jesus is holding them responsible for reading the Bible, reading the scriptures, Reading the Tanakh. Read. Did you never read? How many times did Jesus say this to people? Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Did you not read? Don't you understand? Haven't, don't you know? It's, your, you know? it's our responsibility, friends. It's our responsibility to read and to understand. Or at least pray that we understand. Seek and you will find. Have you never read when, what David did when he had when he had need and he was hungry, he and those who were with him. When he was in need, he had need and hungry. Okay? Key words there. God has something about being hungry. You'll see what I mean as we get further deeper into the scriptures. Okay? Verse 26, how he entered into, the, into God's house at the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread which is not lawful to eat except for the priests and gave also to those who were with him. So according to the Torah, he shouldn't be doing that. But Jesus said, you got to understand there are different levels of commands here. There are the, great, the greatest commands, there are the greater commands and the lesser commands. Sometimes you've got to take the, the greater commands to... There are exceptions of the rule, not... Rule. You don't make the exception the rule, okay? But there are exceptions where you got to take the greater command to overrule the lesser command. Here the greater command is that, hey, we have a need. We're hungry. We need this, okay? According to the law and according to the heart of God, the love of God, we need to eat, okay? So the, it's not that important to keep, to, uh, to keep the showbread. Uh, sitting there on the table and nobody e ever eating it when you got need right in front of your face. Verse 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. A lot of people get this wrong today. I, I, you know, when you're working at work, you got bosses, you got supervisors, and they're like, they like, some people just like to lord over you. They just like to make new rules. They just like to make new policies unnecessary policies, rules. I know a lot of you are going, yeah, I write. Yeah, and because they just, it's a, it's a thing of pride, you know. I'm just, I just got to lord it over you. I just got to, it makes me feel better to make rules over you, to make, to make these rules so I can control you, to make these policies so I control you. Don't vote for the, for the proud people, man. Don't. Vote for the humble, the ones who want less rules, less control of you. God made the Sabbath for man as a blessing for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus is saying you need to catch the spirit of the law here, not just get into the letter of the law. You need to catch the spirit of the law here because the spirit of the law will actually help you to interpret the letter of the law. So the spirit of the law is that God wants to serve man with, with the Torah. And this is the thing too. The Torah is a service to God. It's a blessing to God. It's God's love and grace for you. God loved us God loved us so much that he gave us his law. Who being a father or mother would love their children and yet not give them any rules? I mean they can do whatever they want. 
you know that those children are going to be, could be dead before you know it. If they have absolutely no rules. They can be dead, they can be stolen. I mean, they, God forbid, horrible things can happen if you have no rules. If a, if, if, a, if a parent really loves a child, the parent gives reasonable good rules. Okay? God loves his people. God loves his people, and he gave us his rules to live by so that we can be blessed. The Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for a blessing. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of even the Sabbath. Wow. Powerful words from a powerful Savior, a powerful man. Thank you again for watching. We have uh, just read Mark chapter 2. Next session, we're going to read Mark chapter 3. Don't miss it. Be blessed. Thanks again.